talked some culture, talked some chef, stuff like that. Um, but we got like 80 talks, and about like 30 of them were on containers. So we were like, hey, let's do a container track uh, for sure. And I was super pro containers because I work at Stack Engine and now at Oracle, so like I love container stuff and I do that all day. So I was like, yeah, we should totally do a container track. Uh, to give you guys some more background, um, here in Austin, we do a bunch of stuff uh, surrounding containers. There's uh, there's Docker Austin, which is like a thousand person meetup. We're doing, a, there's a container meetup that Lee runs in microservices. Uh, that's also, I think it just started, it's like over 500 people now. Uh, with Cloud Austin, um, whenever we do like a container talk, um, we always like fill out rack space. So it's like a really, really hot topic. Last year we did a separate conference called Container Days in Austin. Um, and I think it, uh, it, like it, it was like a 200 person conference that we did. How many people went to Container Days? Quick show of hands, sweet. Um, yeah, it was two, like a 200 person conference where we talked about containers and it was all open spaces. So it was kind of what people wanted to talk about. Um, and some common themes uh, from, my, from my Stack Engine days that we've been noticing are um, actually, well, a quick audience poll. Uh, how many people use containers today or have messed around with it? Show of hands. All right. Uh, how many folks use uh, containers in like a production environment? All right, awesome. And then what's the distribute, like um, let's talk about specifics. So uh, how many people like use Kubernetes or interest in Kubernetes? And that's like the primary reason you're here. Uh, what about Mesos? Docker, and uh, anything else that I missed out on that you're interested in, shout out. ECS, okay. Um, awesome, so, um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce Alan. Um, Alan is from HomeAway, and one of, the, one of the reasons we really liked this talk was because this is an actual use case of how HomeAway uses, uh, or uses Mesos in production. And with that, uh, let's give a round of applause for, for Alan. Cool. All right. Um, so if it's not beyond obvious, uh, if you want the slides, uh, that QR code will get you there, and so will that short link. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, things you're going to have to decide when you want to actually go to Mesos in production. And I'll wait a second for the phones to go down. All right. So who am I? Uh, I'm Alan Scherger. I work at HomeAway. I consider myself to be a senior janitor. Uh, we keep the floors clean, even when we don't understand why we're cleaning the floors. Um, and I uh, get the privilege of working on their multi-pass solution. So for about a year, we've been looking at um, how we're going to actually build out the next generation deployment platform for HomeAway. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, if you enjoy this talk and want to talk to us, I have to do the obligation. Oh man, I'm obliged to say that we are uh, definitely hiring. Um, so to get into the talk, uh, we'll start with the Kool-Aid. So we'll break down kind of the pieces of what we've decided to make our decision about. The first step is Docker, um, and we chose it because it allows us to create this contract. This contract is between any kind of application and the hardware resources that it needs. Um, and that's really powerful because that means that I don't care anymore about the runtime of your app. I can put those problems onto the uh, engineer, and I can just focus about how I'm going to actually get the hardware resources that these people need. Um, if you haven't done a lot of Docker things, uh, you should definitely check out Jerome Petazzoni's uh, tutorials here, container.training. It's a two-part series. One is an intro. The other is an advanced course on how to actually uh, orchestrate containers using Docker Swarm. They're really good materials. And the second step in this Kool-Aid is the Mesos part. So Mesos is going to help us centralize all of those contracts and do that by allowing us to pool all of our hardware together so that we can actually just simply schedule things and not worry about where things are running on the machine. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to just talk about Marathon um, as a framework and a means of deploying these Docker containers. And it should be noted that we're only going to take a look at stateless apps. Um, because the persistent layers in Mesos are still pretty young and it's still challenging, but hopefully within a year we'll have another talk about how to actually do persistent layers within Mesos. Um, additionally, if you haven't played with Mesos, I highly recommend you check out uh, the Mantle project. It was written by Cisco. They basically kludge all of the open source tools that you and I use every day together 
um, to actually allow you to build an automated uh, Mesos cluster out in a cloud provider. Um, and then recently, uh, the guys at Mesosphere totally open sourced a DCOS, um, and it's definitely more of a turnkey Mesos solution. It's rather opinionated, but it's also a great way to just get started and get something shipped. So we've decided that we're going to use this centralized service to manage this entirely decentralized architecture. And we're going to do that over convention. But those conventions are definitely going to cause friction. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because you're going to have to make a lot of decisions on what those conventions are going to be. And oftentimes, because the software is so new, you're going to feel like you're juggling a lot of chainsaws. So the first step we're going to look at is how to actually deploy Mesos and get a cluster up and running. In order to do that, you need to know something about cap theorem. So all of these tools that we're going to use today all have the constraints of cap theorem. And I'm not going to go into that today, but you should look it up. Um, the summary is basically systems are either going to be highly consistent or highly available. And there are trade-offs with both, and we have to account for them. Typically in a Mesos setup, because we're doing leader election across all of the base platform and the frameworks, these systems are highly consistent. And that means when we're electing leaders, our systems are actually down. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But in order to uh, strive for that consistency, Mesos has a simple dependency. It just depends on ZooKeeper. But in order to run it in a highly available mode, we need to actually run our Mesos clusters and ZooKeepers with multiple nodes. So because of the way Cap Theorem works and the way that Quorum Theory works, we need to actually uh, run at a minimum three nodes. So we'll have three Mesos nodes, and we'll have three ZooKeeper nodes. They'll both do leader elections, and we'll be able to start getting, start going. Uh, so now that we have our cluster up, we need to run a framework, because the framework is actually how we deploy things onto this Mesos cluster. Like I said, we're going to use Marathon in this case. And Marathon, once again, does leader election. And in order to be highly available, you need to have at least three nodes. Um, when we do this, Marathon relies on Mesos, and it relies on ZooKeeper because it's going to talk to Mesos, and it's going to store its state in ZooKeeper. Um, so my question to you is, what's the problem with this photo? Can anyone picture where an issue or failure might occur? Anybody? All right. So the first issue that, you should, that should be glaringly obvious is, what happens when ZooKeeper dies? Because even though I've offloaded all my persistence there, if that's down, these frameworks are completely hosed. And then the second thing is, how are we going to actually test and roll out upgrades? Mesos offers this tagline of like, you'll be able to centralize your entire data center. But if I only have one version of something running, and I need to do upgrades, or I need to check out a new version, and again, these things are pretty alpha, so there are definitely backwards incompatibilities. And if that breaks my automation, things are going to be sad. I'm clearly not going to be able to just centralize my data center. So this led us to kind of build out this idea of a pod, which is a cluster of clusters. So we're going to have multiple pods and multiple hardware um, SLAs around them. So we'll have a production grade SLA, and we'll have multiple pods in there, and we'll have a not production SLA. So if you're in Amazon, this might change the type of instance types you're doing. Or if you're in a data center, you might be using newer hardware versus older hardware. Um, a trap that I see that a lot of people get into is, they'll tightly couple these hardware SLAs with the kinds of environments and their software environments. And I'd encourage you that when you're starting to plan this out, keep them as decoupled as possible. It's hard to articulate that between ops and development, but it will go a long way, because there are definitely ways that you can run multiple software environments on top of the same Mesos cluster. And we'll see kind of how that works later on. But this pod architecture. It definitely spawns some questions. So like if we're in Amazon or uh, Google Cloud, are we going to actually stripe our pods across availability zones? Because that's what the docs would tell us is a best practice. But when you actually look into how this software is working and how it's actually doing the health checking and scheduling of things, you'll notice that latency is basically your bottleneck. So if I'm going to stripe it across availability zones, I'm already going to get added latency to the system. And what's the effects of that? And then you also run into the problem of how am I going to articulate to engineering that all of, the thing, all of the pods are degraded versus, oh, this availability zone is down, so it's just not here right now. And then there's hardware costs. And uh, this one makes me giggle every time. So when you start looking at this architecture, you'll notice that you have to run three of everything. And 
their first inclination is like, oh, I know. I'll run a Mesos node, a Marathon node, and a Zookeeper node, those apps, all on one box. But the problem with that is that if I'm me and I go into your data center and smash a box with a sledgehammer, you now have three highly consistent things all trying to do leader election at the same time, two of which depend on the one to actually be up. Uh, that's an issue. Um, and then this pod architecture isn't anywhere out on the internet. Like it's a pretty simple idea, but no one's actually built any tooling around how to actually orchestrate our deployments and how do we manage our configuration drift from one pod to another, let alone elevate it to from different environments. And guess what? We haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. Shared services. So we break these up into four quadrants. Uh, one of them is storage. Um, so we're gonna have these containers. They're actually pretty big. Uh, how are we gonna get those distributed? The next is data streaming. These pods are gonna generate a lot of metrics, a lot of logs. How are we gonna actually handle getting those out? Then we have the automated recovery bit. It's 2016. If you're not doing service discovery, I don't know what you're doing. And load balancing is really helpful for keeping things up and hiding failures from our users. And finally, you have automated deployment. This is the whole CI CD paradigm. How are we actually gonna build those containers? How are we actually gonna get them shipped? What are we gonna do about secrets? You know, too often than not, people are just baking their secrets into code or they're putting them in environment variables, which is great, but it leaves you exposed to a bunch of things and we probably need to reevaluate that. And finally, again, orchestration, orchestration, orchestration. It's just not there. What are we gonna do? And it spawns more questions. Like, what are we gonna pick for each stack? Uh, Honestly, your existing systems probably weren't built for the ephemerality of these stateless systems. Um, like metrics, for example, if you were like hoping to have an instance ID attached to each container, that's not gonna work anymore. Um, you know, at what varying degrees are you gonna push these shared services down the stack? Are you gonna put them in your pod level? Or are you gonna put them at your region level or where in between? How are you gonna educate all of your engineers on how these new systems work? And my last point, what business problem is this containerization actually solving? Because if you're not solving a business problem, why are we doing it? So I want you to have answers to these before you start on this journey. And if you're not overwhelmed by now, you're clearly a robot and better human than me, but this can be very overwhelming, so definitely strap in. We'll uh, hopefully debug some of this in uh, this talk to make you feel a little more comfortable, but there's a lot going on. The first step is uh, actually getting your app to run in a container. Um, like, because if we can't do that, everything else up top is just completely a waste of time. So for HomeAway, we run a lot of Java. How many folks here are doing Java? All right, cool. Um, so the first thing that you'll look online is like, oh, I know, I'll use this illegal script to go grab me a JDK and uh, slam it into a Docker container, and then I'll just run Java as my natural command. Well, the problem is, is that the Java command, uh, executable, doesn't actually reap zombies. Uh, and there's a great article about why you need to do this, but basically you can pollute the process table of your slaves and crash everything on that node if you're not actually doing zombie reaping. There's two tools here, Tiny and Container Pilot. Uh, I, if you're a minimalist, you'll love Tiny. All it does is solve this problem. If you want a little more uh, awesome sauce, you should definitely check out Container Pilot. It's a way of describing your app in JSON and actually getting it, there's got some pretty cool features. Next is secrets. I could talk about this all day, uh, and you should trust nothing that I say and evaluate this for yourself because I'm not a security expert. But at HomeAway, we came up with this concept of this secret zero problem, which is, it's, I have a whole variety of things that I need to keep secret, but at the end of the day, there's this first seed secret that I have to get implanted. And baking that into the container is not a good idea. You should not be baking these certs into a container. And we need to look at, if we're gonna use environment variables, how are we gonna hide those? Because if we're gonna use the Marathon API to launch our containers with environment variables, well, that's great, they're completely exposed via the API. And again, if s they're exposed on the slaves as well when you do a Docker inspect. So the recommendation that I'd give you to look into is possibly running a sidecar next to your app, and we implicitly find ways to trust the container and talk to the container via the sidecar, and the sidecar is what injects these secrets into our app. Talk about this a little further. We'll talk about these layers of trust. So I have a container. How do I know that I can trust it? Because it's asking for a secret. Well, it's gonna go talk to this secret service. 
And the secret service is gonna get your secrets from the secret storage. You might use a HashiCorp tool like Vault. It's really great, it's really simple. There are new ones coming out every day. You should pick one and do it. But the secret service needs to look at our continuous delivery tool to actually be able to know that like, hey, I trust that this container was launched by my continuous delivery solution and therefore I can maybe trust it. But in order for that to be trusted, we have to trust the registry that the container was actually from. And in order to trust the registry, you actually have to put the seed of trust now into your continuous integration so that when this container is actually built, I trust that it was built on my system. And finally, I can only trust my CI if I can actually trust the code repo for where all of these things are coming from. And this is actually really hard. Um, it's really hard to get this right. We're striving to do it. But uh, I encourage people to go out and, and figure out solutions for this. Um, RMI. So the next thing you're going to look at it for a Java app is actually figuring out how you can connect into that JVM and get the statistics out. Uh, it's rather a complex process to explain right now in this talk. Uh, I do have slides on it. If you guys are interested, by all means, raise your hand, ask me, hey, how did you solve RMI? And we'll go back and review it. Otherwise, the slides are online. You can check it out. It's pretty cool. So Mesos networking, that's the next step. I have this container. Now I need to launch it somewhere. But in order to, for it to have value, I need to be able to actually access it wherever it's getting launched. And this is where you have a lot of choices. But the first layer of choice is with that Docker runtime. So Docker supports about five different versions of uh, networking. Some of the more advanced stuff is overlay, which you might have played with. I suggest you research this and check out more. There's also custom plugins, which will get more valuable in a second. For this talk, we're gonna use bridging because it's the simplest. But again, I'll go over some resources that are pretty cool, but I haven't tried this, so go out and experiment for yourself and go actually submit a talk to our Mesos user group because we'd love to have you show up and explain to us how Mesos networking works. But basically, uh, as of recent versions, Mesos supports both a per container IP um, as well as they're working on actually supporting the open container standard for how to do container network interfaces. And this is critical because Mesos doesn't just want to wrap Docker, they also want to wrap Rocket, they want to wrap any kind of container technology that supports the open container initiative. And this works coming along, you can track it in the JIRA tickets. But again, for, this sa or for the sake of the talk, we're only going to use this host and bridge networking. And now comes my favorite talk, service discovery. So in order to do service discovery in Marathon, we're going to launch this container. It's going to spin up, and it's going to go try and talk to something. Some of the, the first part that we have to talk about in order for this to make sense, though, is our Marathon config. When you launch a task with Marathon, you end up supplying this port mapping. And this is really cool. Here I've defined basically two ports. I have one named foo and one named bar. You might call yours app and help. And I told, I told Marathon, hey, container port for uh, this foo service is going to be on 8081. That means I know that within my container, foo is going to start and bind to 8081, and bar will start and bind to 8082. But because we're using this network bridge and masquerading is involved, we need a host port. And the host port for both of these is set to zero, which means it's going to get an ephemeral port that just happens to be free on the machine. And that's all well and good, but I have to find a way to actually discover what these ephemeral ports are in order to talk to my containers. And once they're launched, we can figure out that like, oh hey, I can from the Mesos API, from the tasks, figure out that foo has got an ephemeral port of 31792 and bar has got another port, and that's great. But it's not good enough, because having to go write custom clients for you to talk to the Mesos tasks API is pretty insane. So one of the things that they've done is they've built out a dynamic DNS uh, solution. And the way that this works is it just talks directly to Mesos and automatically builds you out records um, for your containers. And it's got a REST API and it, it's pretty sweet. So here we go to look at my app and we see like, hey, what hosts are my, is this task running on? And it receives, I get back some A records, which is pretty great. I realize it's the REST API, but you'd get back some A records. <sighs> but here's where it falls apart. So when I go to actually do a service record lookup, all I get back are all of the ports that are listening on TCP because named ports aren't a first class citizen in Mesos DNS yet. And that's not going to work for me. However, they're aware of this and it's in issue 61 and they're working on it. The new, what I showed you here with the port definitions, this is new as of, uh, nope. That where you have names and labels is new as of Marathon 1.x and that was only released a few weeks ago. So they are working on it. Um, 
So Mesos DNS isn't going to work for us today, but console might work for us. And what I want you to take away from console today is go play with it, but realize it's a highly consistent system. So it's going to suffer from when it's doing leader elections that it's down. One of the ways that we can get around that is if we're using the DNS side of console, you can actually set up caching. This configuration will give you 10 seconds of delay time so that during that re-election, if it gets done within 10 seconds, you'll actually still be able to use DNS the entire time. And finally, uh, Eureka. It doesn't get talked about enough, but this is how Netflix does service discovery. Yeah, it's written in Java, but it actually just works. Um, it's highly available. So yes, it will occasionally send you stale data if it's not in quorum, but that's pretty unlikely, and it fixes itself automatically. If you haven't checked out Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, they have a lot of projects out here that make it really easy to get going with the Netflix stack, and I highly recommend you check them out. So now we have load balancing. So we have these services. Our services have found one another, but how are we actually going to get a browser there? And the first project you're probably going to look at is Marathon Load Balancer. And it's actually pretty awesome. Uh, it's a little Python script that wraps HA proxy, um, and we can launch it. Awesome. That didn't work at all. But we can launch it using this simple Docker command that you can't read. Um, and the way that this works is when we launch a, uh, a Marathon app, there's two parts. We're going to set up this labels. We're going to put a label on our app to tell it, hey, when I launch, I want to be in the HA proxy group of external. And when I have these port mappings, these service ports come into use. So here, I've explicitly set them. But if we set them to 0, Marathon guarantees to give you one that's free across the whole framework. So this allows you to do pretty cool things. Like when our uh, load balancer is loaded, if I go hit it on the service port, I'll actually get back the traffic load balanced across all of my containers. And that's pretty great. This will probably solve 99% of your solution. Where it falls down, though, is with Java, or the way that we've architected our apps, I have more than just, a, first off, load balancing. This will, the problem with Marathon Load Balancer is it load balances every port. The problem with that is, Things like my health checks, things like RMI, things like my secret service don't need load balancing at all. So every app is going to bring with it all these extra ports, which Marathon Load Balancer is doing extra work for. It's completely unnecessary. So if you look at the Mantle project, they recommend using this cool little uh, load balancer called Traffic. It's written in Go. It's got a lot of functionality. But Traffic suffers from the other side of the pendulum problem, which is Traffic only lets you load balance one port on your server. So if you do have multiple ports that you need to load balance, you're still up a creek. The good news is it's all code, right? So we can go create PRs and actually patch this and set up label schemes, but no one's done that yet. And finally, uh, for those of you using RPC or playing with the DCOS stuff, there's another project called Linkerd. Um, and Linkerd is great. Uh, it's really cool. You can easily deploy it. Um, there's just one quick gotcha, and that is um, when people claim that you can actually launch an agent and ensure that it's load balanced on every node. They do this via this constraints method. And I want you to check out this issue because they explain to you why that that guarantee is not always true. It's probably, it's likely true, but it's not always true. And they've got an issue to open and actually go solve, solve the problem of running services on every node. So now we have services and they're load balanced, but how do I actually know what my services are doing? And that's where logging comes in. So the Docker logging driver uh, will actually log everything. Um, and by default, it will pick up standard error and standard out, and it will throw it into these JSON files. What I want you to take away from today is those files aren't getting rotated unless you set max size. So if you go to production and you haven't, you're still using this logger, you can run out of disk space unless you set max size. The second thing is that Mesos is also independently logging all of your standard error and standard out to this thing called a sandbox. Um, and Finally, after a new version, it's got log rotate support. I wrote a blog post on it. That's where that link goes. Uh, so you should check that out and figure out what you want to do. Then we have the remote storage of logs. There's a bajillion solutions out there. I'm not going to tell you what works, but I am going to tell you that it's a pretty cool idea to actually have our syslog dumped directly to Kafka and have everything out of Kafka go to a bunch of different analytical systems. You might want to check that out. And some gotchas with logging. So. First off, when you're going in the container world, you have to realize that the slave host where your container is running has a host name, and that's different than the host name that's in your running container. So when you end up setting up like log entries and you've default said, put in my host name in there, what does that mean anymore? Do you want the container host name? Do you want the slave that it was running on so you can actually go find the box? Do you want both? I can't tell you what you want. You're going to have to figure that out. 
The next thing is you're going to quickly learn the difference between a Mesos task ID, which is assigned by the framework and not guaranteed to be unique, versus the container ID, which is assigned via Mesos and used when it launches the Docker container as the name of the container. The problem with this is that most of your engineering group, and yourself included, are going to get very comfortable using the Marathon API, and the Marathon API has absolutely no correlation to the container IDs. So when you go to actually sort your logs, you're not going to see, like, oh, I'm looking for this task, but I only can sort on container. There's pretty, in the Docker logging drivers, you can end up writing your own custom uh, appenders to solve this problem, um, but it's something you're going to have to do. And next is, uh, and we've been bitten by this, is log, using log file as a source in Splunk and putting metadata in it. So we built out all these fancy dashboards, but the only way that we figured out that I'm at foo and running in tests was based on the source of the log file. So when we actually go to this new streaming log idea, we end up breaking all of our logging dashboarding, and then we have to rework that. And that's something to consider when trying to roll this out. And metrics. Uh, this is pretty quick. There are a lot of choices. I'm not going to pretend to tell you what the answer is. Uh, there are a lot of simple choices. There are a lot of cool open source choices. You need to figure that out for you and figure out how to get it into your app. And then application deployment, which I've said again and again, doesn't exist. And it makes me sad because we need, so we need a tool out there that can actually handle the configuration and moving of containers through multiple Mesos environments. And uh, hopefully we're going to maybe open source something that we're working on because we have to solve this problem. But I'm also hoping that the community here can get involved and help us solve this problem too. Which brings us to the end of this talk and where I strongly encourage you, if you're interested in Mesos, to at least join the global community groups. Um, and if you're interested in hanging out in Austin and working with us, uh, we run the Mesos meetups here in town and they're great. Um, we'd love to see you out there. We'd love to give you talks. And of course, if you have any questions about this, we'll have a Q&A session now. But feel free to reach me. That QR code gives you more information on how to contact me. And of course, that's my Twitter. Um, so that's all I have today. I guess I'll open it up to questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, when does the Mesos group meet? And uh, luckily, the person who runs it is in the back. When do we meet, Praveen? Uh, okay, so sometime next month we'll have our next meetup. Go join the group now and you'll get the emails. Any, sure. Okay, so RMI. So now that maybe you un understand a little more about how this works, let's dig into some of the normal, so a normal application, right? I'm going to curl from my browser. I'm going to hit this on 3100. I'm going to hit this bridge, and this bridge uses masquerading to actually get the packets to the right application on 8080. That's awesome. The problem with RMI is that that 8080 can't be 8080 because RMI doesn't work over NAT. So what you need to do is somehow make that application start on the same ephemeral port that is getting assigned to the bridge. And you can do that by setting, when we ask, tell Marathon, hey, run my app, set the container port to zero and the host port to zero, and it will assign both of those ports to the ephemeral port when it launches your container. And the way that you get that data is this amazing little shell script that basically looks at, um, when Marathon starts your app, it's gonna start it with a bunch of environment variables like port and an index number. And uh, what we do is, it's pretty simple. If I've set RMI port to that port index number, I just like super evaluate it and set it, and I'll use it. The other gotcha in here is that the RMI server host name, again, it comes back to the host's name on the host is different than the host name in the container. And I need to make sure that the host name of the RMI server is the host name of the, the host, not the container. So we do some magic here. Marathon by default sets the uh, host variable here to the host of the, s the slave that's running. So you get that for free. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, uh, it's just a wrapper that we use to wrap uh, our jetty from starting. Um, it's bash. It's not pretty. I'd love to. Um, we basically had this old thing called control scripts. It was written by a highly intelligent person. It's just been refactored. And the way that we do the deploy, so control scripts would handle the way that we do deployments. 
and it needed to be simplified because the way that we do deployments now within Docker is a lot easier than a co-tenant Java deployment onto a box. Um, so I've simplified that. We can, uh, I'll probably work with, if you're interested, I'm sure we can figure out a way to get to talk and shared knowledge. Anything else? Uh, no. So the question was, do we run our syslog in the container? And the answer was no. So we run our syslog on the host itself, um, and we rely on the forwarding from the Docker logging driver into our syslog. Um, that's the pattern I'd recommend. It seems like a lot of overhead to start running these shared services in every single container. Um, like you might be tempted to like run the Splunk, like if you're using Splunk, put the Splunk forwarder in every little container and then have those forward out. But it's a lot better if you can find ways to just simplify it. That way you have more resources to actually schedule stuff. Yeah, you have to pick a compromise. So, so the way that you can do it, right, is that we can have the host name be the actual host of the box, and within the log entry, we'll set up a structured log value of the container ID, which you probably already need, and you actually don't want it to be the container ID, you want it to be the task ID. Um, so the host name of that um, container becomes fairly useless. Where that idea breaks down, though, uh, is in New Relic. So New Relic will actually use the host name in the container, and so once again, you need that mapping. The good news is, is that if you're running the New Relic agent on your box, it'll grab all of those, and it's smart enough to map them so that you can still figure that out, but it's still not a task ID or a container ID, it's the host name. Yep. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'd, so the question was, uh, when we were doing the initial evaluation, did we have any idea of the scope of work that was required to actually ship this thing? Uh, I'd be safe to say that uh, we're all human, and I think we vastly underestimated the amount of work that was required. Um, I definitely would recommend, uh, especially after doing uh, Jerome's tutorials with Docker Swarm, if you are a smaller team and you have smaller hardware sizes, you should definitely check out a more simple solution. Um, I think the Mesos community will start to maybe figure out how to tailor themselves more towards a smaller community. Um, there's like the mini Mesos project. Um, but yeah, this is definitely more of an enterprise grade tool, which is great, but it's got its trade-offs of, there's just more work that has to get done to make it bulletproof. Anything else? Nope. Um, yeah, so um, we so I do run a couple of jobs that are just like quick little Python scripts because I'm pretty sure Python 2.7 is going to be everywhere. Um, we run into a problem where Artifactory won't sync. Um, I'm going to mess this up. Cloud, it's the CDN, AWS CDN. The, yeah, you can't like read it, and so I have some Python scripts that sync those things. Correct, yeah, so the question was, how are we, within the pods, how are we actually dividing up the uh, resources? Uh, um, we haven't used um, the constraints yet too much, but they're definitely there, and the um, resources and attributes that you can put on Mesos boxes allows you to slice them up, and there is a mapping into Marathon, so you can do that. The biggest takeaway is that I can use this, these separations of hardware levels to actually, I can run multiple test clusters on one Mesos pod and stripe it across the pod so that even when one goes down, the test environment's still up. Um, and I think that's where we're gonna start to see a lot of increase in speed and process because we no longer have to go uh, acquire all of this hardware for a performance test or acquire all of this hardware to like spin up Johnny's little test environment. He can just click a button and boom, he's off to the races. And we use service discovery so that he's siloed and all by himself. Yeah, um, I am not qualified. So the question was, persistent storage, where is it at? Uh, I am not qualified to give you an answer, but I will certainly give you an opinion. Um, 
If you want to do some research, you should go look at Flocker um, from Cluster HQ. Those guys have been trying to solve that problem since Docker day one. Um, they've got the probably one of the best solutions out there. On the flip side, the Mesos guys are working on a persistence storage solution specifically for Mesos, so outside of Flocker. So you should check out both and play with them. Um, I know, like for example, the uh, Cassandra um, layout, the Cassandra framework for Mesos uses the persistent storage. Yep. All right, I think that's it. Cool. All cool. Right. Cool. Let's give Alan a round of applause. Um, and also a couple of quick things. Um, if y'all, so um, for those of you who are new to DevOps days. Um, we do talks in the morning and we do open spaces in the afternoon. Open spaces are like topics that people in the audience or people at the conference want to talk about. So, you know, uh, if people want to talk about Mesos and stuff like that, just pitches it, pitch it as a topic and that becomes an open space. Um, I think it's around 10.40. Uh, the next session here kicks off at 10.55. So take a break, uh, you know, buy a break, whatever, and then we'll see you back in a little bit. <laughs>